So we had ended class with this last one. We had calculated the mean of this group. Question was, could we draw a scatter plot? I'd ask you to do that on your own just as a check. This is what it would look like. I've got my mean point on there in blue, 75, 72. And then I drew what I thought would be the best line of best fit through that mean point so that some of my points were above and some were below. Now, I chose to use 88.85 as another point that my line went through. And when you're finding your equation of your line, all of us should have similar equations of line, but slightly different depending on what point you used. Because once you choose your point, well, you could use your point and the mean point and your slope formula and find out the slope of your line. Now, I picked a point so that everything worked out nice numbers, but was your slope close to one? It might have been a little bit more. It might have been a little bit less. Okay? So depending on what you chose as your point, you should have got a slope, if you simplified your fraction, something close to one because that's the general shape of our line then with whatever slope that you got, you could get your equation of your line. So I got a slope of 1. I'm going to write it out in y equals mx plus b form. So if I use that strategy, I know my slope is 1. I can plug that in for m. Plug in my point for x and y, and then figure out my b value. And in my case, my b value was negative 3. Depending on your slope, your b value is going to be slightly different. So finding an equation of a line by hand, you could use y equals mx plus b. Once you know the slope, you plug that in for m, and you plug in your point for x and y, and solve for b. If you are more familiar with or more comfortable with using the point slope form of the equation of the line, and I find over time at least for me, y equals mx plus b is something that sticks in your head. y minus y1 equals mx minus x1 doesn't stick as well as y equals mx plus b. So I find later on I use this more mathematically, even though early on this is easier perhaps to use. If you're wondering where this formula comes from, take a look at your slope formula and just notice that it's your slope formula rearranged. Just multiply by the bottom on both sides, and you've got your slope formula with one of your values being x and y instead of an actual point. Same thing, plug in your slope, plug in your point, and you'll get the same equation if you rearrange it. Now that I've got an equation for my trend line, for my line of best fit, I can say, well, that student that had an 80 According to this, I would predict a 77 for their final grade. Where is that 77 on their exam? Let me just look at the data here. No, yeah, 77 for their final grade. So take a look at your results. Were they somewhat similar? Okay, again, we're going to have slight variations depending on what you chose as your point and plugging that point into equation but the idea should be that it's fairly similar now that's kind of a problem the problem of well I made one trend line or one line of best fit and somebody else made another line of best fit how can we find the best line of best fit and that's what we're gonna look at today Before we get to that completely, we're going to do a little bit of interpreting what a line of best fit does and what it means. So what is your slope? Your slope is a value showing how much your y value increases, because slope is rise over run, how much your y value increases as your x value increases by one unit. Now, when we write slope as an actual number, so your slope is 4.32, oh. 
that would mean that your y values go up 4.32 every time your x value goes up by 1. When you write your slope as a fraction, 3 over 2, and you think of rise as 3 and run as 2, you're saying every time my y goes up by 3, my x goes up by 2. But if you took that 3 over 2 and wrote it as a decimal, 1.5, that would say my y value increases by 1.5 as my x value increases by 1. Other things that are important when you have it in y equals mx plus b, you've got your y-intercept. That's your initial value, where it's starting from. And so sometimes those have meaning, sometimes they do not. So we're going to look at some examples here. Relationship between age and the time they can run one kilometer. Nothing like taking a six-month-old and telling them to run a kilometer because this is for statistics. But you could plug it into the equation and see if that would be realistic. So they found this equation regression line to be y equals negative a half x plus 20. So in that, our slope would be negative a half and our y-intercept would be 20. So we need to interpret what does that negative one-half mean. Well, in this case, every time a child's age increases, so for every year the child's age increases, the time to run one kilometer goes down by 0 0.5. So again, our x value in this case is our age. So each increase by 1 in our x value. And our slope, if we change that to a decimal, that's negative 0.5. That means that the time is going to go down by half a minute. Now our y-intercept is 20. Doesn't make sense in this situation. That means a zero-year-old, is that such a word? A zero-year-old? That sounds really weird, eh? Anyways, they could run a kilometer in 20 minutes. Well, that doesn't make much sense. So we have an equation, a line of best fit, but then we have to think about, well, when does this make sense? When does it stop making sense? I'm almost 40. If we plug in my age into here, it'd be like lightning speed. I can, I can, currently I can't quite teleport a kilometer at a time, but I am very close, according to this equation, to being able to just teleport one kilometer at a time. I can get anywhere very, very quick. Of course, the question does say, age x in years of a young person. So maybe I'm beyond the scope of this study. Studying the number of trees and the number of birds in a forest. Again, put all those data points in and got a regression line of 5.4x plus 8. x is the number of trees, y is the number of birds. So what does that 5.4 mean? I'll get you to write it down first, then we'll put it up, just so that you have to think about it. And what does the y equals 8 mean? So in this case, if you increase by one tree, you should expect to find another 5.4 birds. Love seeing that 0.4 of a bird. And if an area has no trees, there could still be birds in that area. And that number of eight would mean that you would have eight birds. Again, you'd have to consider, is this realistic or not? 
but perhaps there's trees in surrounding areas and birds fly over that area. All right, that's enough analyzing. Now we can get to our least squares regression, trying to find, I can go back, I went too fast. Yes, there you go. All right, least squares regression. That is trying to find the best line of best fit. So we use an idea called residuals, and it's very similar to how when we calculated variance. When we calculated variance, we figured out how far something was away from the mean, and then squared it so that negative values and positive values came out positive. So with a residual, here we have a picture, and I think the picture really shows it well, where we have some points above our line of best fit, some points below our line of best fit. And if we just go straight up and straight down to the point, we have some points above the line, we'll have those as positive residuals, and some points below the line with negative residuals. Now we would want all those positives and negatives to sort of cancel out. If they all cancel out, to be zero, you know that your line is as close as possible to them. You also want each individual residual to be as close to the line as possible. So what we do with each of those residuals is we square them so that we're dealing with all positive numbers, and then we want that square number when it's all added up to be as small as possible. And if we do that, we've got the best line of best fit because it's closest to all of our points. Now we're going to have, for the most part, we're going to have our calculator to calculate all these things, but I'm, I missed a box. Oh, I missed clicking it. Oh, sorry. Ah, residual. There it is. Okay. How many people figured it out before I clicked it? Good. Awesome. Now, we're going to find this out with our calculator. But before it goes into your calculator, someone actually had to figure these things out and how it worked. These formulas are not on your formula sheet. But this is how the slope of your line of best fit is found using least squares residuals. So we've got some crazy notation. We'll look at an example of what this notation means. So your slope will be the sum of xy over the sum of x squared. I don't know if sum is the right word, but it has sums in it. And the sum of xy is this formula where you add every x times y together, then subtract adding up all your x's, multiplied by adding up all your y's, dividing by how many things you have. Okay, so when you look at this formula, it should really not intuitively make any sense. So are we all, are we uh, good? Yeah, no intuitive feeling like, oh, that makes total sense to me. Good, good. And if you thought about it long enough, and simplify things, this is what would appear. But we're not going to go into that right now. Just thankful that someone did that for us. And we're going to divide by sx squared, which is this. So in order to solve it by hand, what you would do is you would make a chart. You'd make a chart of all of your points. So in this case, we've got an example with three points. 1, 3, 2, 1, and 3, 5. And so if I listed all those points, x's and y's, and the ones that they go together, then if we look at our formulas, in our formulas we have x times y sometimes, and we have x squared. So if we go back to our formulas here, in this second formula, 
we have x times y's. And in this formula, we have x squared. So in our chart, we have x times y's and x squared. And if we sum each of those, add up all of those columns, we get the following numbers. And underneath here, I've written what those numbers mean. The first one, the six, that's the sum of all your x's. The second one, the nine, that's the sum of all your y's. The third one, the 20, is the sum of all x times y's. And the last one is the sum of all x squareds. So now you could put those values into those formulas. Calculate what numbers you get. In this case, we get 1 as a slope. So what the least squares residual line does is, sa is says that's the best slope possible to use. So in order to get an equation of a line, we need a slope and a point. So if that's our best slope possible, what's our best point to use? Our best point to use would be our mean point, the average of our x's, the average of our y's. So now that we have a slope and a point, we can find an equation of a line. There's using y minus y1 equals m x minus x1, simplifying it, and our equation is y equals x plus 1. Now we can do this on our calculator as well. So we're going to take out our calculators, we're going to hit our stat button, go to our stat lists. If you have data in there, you can go clear down clear down, and we're going to put these three points in. So we've got one, two, three, and three, one, five. Once you have your points in your stat list, we could go to our stat plot, the same place that we drew histograms, and box and whisker plots. We can go down to number one, push enter, and this time we can turn on a scatter plot. Automatically, an X list and a Y list comes up. Make sure it matches with where you put your data. So I put my X coordinates in list one, my Y coordinates in list two. Turn your stat plot on and then if you go zoom and 9 it'll zoom to statistics. Now if you have other graphs going on in your y equals sometimes they'll even start appearing on this screen. So another thing you might want to do is go to y, oh there, we are. there it is. And sometimes you can't do any calculations because your graphing calculator is doing, you see, mine's still graphing. Right? That's really annoying because we'll, we'll reenact this. Okay? I'm going to just change my window just enough to make it have to recalculate everything. I'm going to 3.21 now. So now when I hit graph, it's got to recalculate everything and it's got to redraw everything. And if I try to touch any buttons while it's redrawing, nothing's going to happen because it's working. So a helpful button, we're going to wait until, there it is. Helpful button is if you push the on button. Boy, even my, this is really slow. But do you see that it just barely was able to show it, but I stopped it. Anytime your calculator is working on something and you're, you don't have the patience, your on button is a break. It shuts down whatever program's running at that moment. So it's kind of helpful. Especially in this case where I'm like, oh, I've got an extra graph on there, and I don't want that. So I push the on button. I stop it at that point. Now I can go to y equals and go, yeah, I don't really need to graph any double angle cos formulas right now. And now when I graph, now I have options of touching other things right away because it's not spending all that time graphing something I don't need. So I put it in stat plot. I went zoom 9 for the statistic zoom so that it zoomed to these points nicely. And now we've got those three points. 
Now our calculator lets us calculate this y equals x plus 1 quickly. We go to the stat button again. This time we go over to calculate. And if we want to find a line of best fit, we are doing a linear regression. Oh, too far. Notice your calculator also has a quadratic regression, a cubic regression, a quartic regression. Why do I have two linear? I like this number four. Ax plus b. Let's do that one. So linear regression. It has a linear regression where you just put the x second. But if you like y equals mx plus b, use number four. Exponential and logarithmic. So it's got a lot of regressions. Depending on what data you collect, if your data looks like a parabola, well, then you would want to have a quadratic regression. So if you push enter on number four, it's going to come up with a list. If you have an older calculator, it just says lin reg, and you have to do L1 comma L2. It's going to come up with a list. We don't have any points happening with a frequency. So for your frequency there, you can just delete that. So if something comes up as a frequency, you can delete that. For storing your regression, it's going to be helpful to store this into y equals so we can actually graph that line. So we can do that right away. In your notes, they say push your vars button, arrow over to y vars, push one on function, and then you can pick which y equals you want. If you want y1, push enter on y1, and y1 appears. Okay? That's what's in your booklets. I'm going to also show you, so I'm going to delete that out. You can also get y1, y2, y3 as a place to store by going to your shortcuts. Your shortcuts are by going alpha y equals, the same place that you go Oh, do I not have shortcuts on here? Great. Alpha y equals. There, I do have shortcuts. Okay, I need to go back to where I was. Stat, calculate, number four, linear regression, store equation. Alpha y equals, shortcuts. Shortcut menus come up. Arrow over until you get to y vars. And Y1 to Y0 are all listed there as well. So you can push enter. I think that's, that shortcut's a little bit faster than going through that other technique. Then once you go to calculate, it calculates this as well. AX plus B and tells you A is 1, B is 1. And now if I go to Y equals, it has already graphed that line. So if I hit graph, my data points are there, and my line of best fit, the best one possible, is shown. If I go back to my stat list that I had before, and what did we calculate? The mean was 2, 3, our mean point? Yeah. If I add that point 2 comma 3, you can see that our line of best fit goes through that point perfectly. So our least squares regression line is figuring out the best slope possible, and it's going through our mean point. And all those instructions and what we pushed are on our next page there. Again, um, for the y equals, if you want to put what was it, alpha y equals, and then did it show up as y vars? Is that what? Then you went over to y vars, your y variables, as a shortcut. So if you want to write that down as well so that you can paste it into your y equals, that's helpful.
So here's our next question. You've got a bunch of data. We're going to enter that data into our calculator and then use that to solve a bunch of questions. So I'll let you enter it in. I'll enter it into my calculator at the same time. With your data all entered, hit graph. Did it appear like this? Oh, it's frozen on your end. And did you get your line of best fit to go through like that? Check in your equation of your line of best fit. Are our values the same? If our values are different, chances are when you were typing in one data point into your calculator, you made a mistake. So if you don't have 0.117, or if everybody has something different, then it points to me as putting in the one data point that I made a mistake. I'm thinking I didn't because when I look at my equation, it was the same as I'd calculated the last time I did it. So unless I made the same mistake twice, which is possible, Zoom 9. Yeah. Let's see if your stat plot is turned on. So you haven't turned it on yet, so that's why it doesn't know to do that. Yeah, yeah so now if we go Zoom 9. Perfect. And the other thing we notice with this is that we wrote things to three sig figs, and because we wrote them to three sig figs, we're using our approximation sign for that. Second stat plots right up there, y equals. So now we have our equation, we have our line of best fit. The line that's actually drawn, and when you store your regression line in y1, the nice thing about using the store is it keeps all the decimal places. Yes, okay, perfect. All right, so using our equation to find the cost of a thousand kilometer flight. Well, our, on our equation, our x values are the kilometers. So if we go to our graph, we need to find out when x is a thousand, what would y be? All stuff that you want to calculate from your graph can be found using the second trace button because above it it says calculate. And if I want to calculate a specific value, that's number one. I can type in 1,000 and it will tell me the value of y. So y is 200.6. Okay. Now since this is a value, notice that I didn't write three sig figs. I went to pennies. That is sometimes acceptable because it's a monetary value. Again, we need to use our approximation signs because we did round that. If you wanted to write that to three sig figs, how would you do that? Okay. If you wanted to write that as three sig figs, this would be the most awkward way to write $200, but you would have to write 2.00 times 10 to the 2. Because as soon as you write 200, that's only one sig fig because the zero's at the end. What's that? No, 10 to the 2 to get 200. Oh, yeah, then I wouldn't have to. Yeah, I could do that. 201, yeah, that's, that's totally. If I wanted to do 200, this is what I do, but you're right. <laughs> oh, man, I was hoping it would be the 2.00 times 10 to the 2, but you're right, it's 201. Oh, huge rounding error like disastrous. If you wanted to find the cost of a $2,000, 2,000 kilometer, not $2,000, you're going to have to change your window. Because if we go to Y, if we go to our calculate, 
and we want to do 2,000. If you're on calculate, you don't have to go second calculate again because it'll just let you type in another number. So that's a little shortcut. If I type in 2,000, though, it's going to give me an error because my window doesn't go up to 2,000. In fact, right now, my window only goes up to... I got to quit first. My window only went up to 1,633. So if I make it go up further, like 2,003, then it's past 2,000. Now I hit graph. It redraws everything. And now I can go second, calculate the value at 2,000. And it will calculate this even though it's off the window for our y values. So you can't see the point at all, right? Because the point happens at 318.01 or 02. But if I wanted to see that actual point, I could change my y scale to 400. just to get the pleasure of seeing that little flashing thing if that makes you happy. <laughs> and so our, we've got 318.02. Now that would be extrapolation because it's beyond the data points that we had. Measuring correlation. The Pearson product moment correlation coefficient, also known as the R value. <laughs> I don't know why they don't call it the PPMCC value, but I guess they decided if you take the average of all those letters, maybe you get R. I'm not sure. So the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient is used to describe the strength of the correlation. Now, again, for this course, we're not going to go into the nitty-gritty of how does one find this, how does one describe this, what does it, what does the number mean exactly. We are just going to realize that certain numbers mean certain things, okay? It shows up as R squared and R. So what we have is this one has an R squared value of 0.94. The closer it is to 1, 1 would be perfect. Everything shows up on that line, whereas 0.94 it's pretty close to one, so we would say that this has a strong positive correlation. Now, our R values, that was an R squared value. The R value can have values between negative one and one. The closer it is to one, the closer it is to a really strong positive correlation. The closer it is to negative 1, the closer it is to having a strong negative correlation. And if you have 0, that represents that there's no correlation whatsoever. It really doesn't know where to draw the line because it could be anywhere and there would be no correlation. So closer to 1, strong and positive. Closer to negative 1, strong and negative. So on the next page, we just have a bunch of different scatter plots and what the R value would be for those different scatter plots. So you can see as things get more spread out, the R value goes down. These ones, top ones, all have a negative correlation. The bottom ones, 
all have a positive correlation, and if they formed the line perfectly, then your R value would be either positive 1 or negative 1 perfectly. It's not a slope. It's not like it gets closer to 1, it gets closer to 45 degree angle. It just is it makes a line perfectly. So in general, when we get our R values, if it's in a certain range, we use certain words to describe it. If it's between 0 and 0.25, we'd say it's very weak. We'd almost say that there was no correlation. And then it goes to weak to moderate, and anything above 0.75 is considered a strong correlation. You might even look at the 0.81s and go, hmm, it's not that strong. But once you get to 0.9 and 0.95, you'll notice that your points really look like they form a straight line. Again, there's a complicated mathematical formula to figure these things out. And they were using some of those same things that we used to find our regression line. These aren't on your formula sheet. You don't need to know how to calculate them. This is just for interest. Everything we will be doing will be done with our calculator. Remember these points? These were the points that we used before. 1, 3, 2, 1, and 3, 5. And for those points, do you remember our line of best fit not looking like it went very close through them? In fact, if we go to our calculator and I quickly put them in again, Was it 315? Thank you. Zoom 9. There it is. Oh, and I'm still drawing our line from before, so I'm going to push on. I'm going to go stat, calculate, number 4, linear regression. I'm going to store this into Y1. We get our same line of best fit that we had before. And when we graph it, it shows up the same. It looks like our points are quite far, right? Would you have chosen that slope, or would you have chosen this slope if you had to draw it by hand? You might have chosen that other slope. And so this one apparently is the best line, but because you could draw so many different lines that you might think would fit better, this shouldn't have a strong correlation. Now, to turn on our correlation, I don't know if some of you might have it on already, but when you calculated that, if I go back and recalculate this, did anybody's calculator also have R and R squared listed? Some say yes. Most of us are saying no. So there's a way when we do our regression to get the correlation coefficients there. To do that, we have to turn it on. To turn it on, we go to our catalog. So we go second catalog. And catalog lists every single function this graphing calculator has. In order to turn this on, we need to turn our diagnostics on. So you can either arrow down until you get to D, or if you push the letter D, oh, it will start at your D's, and then you can arrow down until you find Diagnostic on. Push enter on diagnostic on. If it says done, it's been turned on. Now I'm going to arrow up to this again. And now R squared and R show up. So our correlation coefficient for this one is 0 0.5. And that's all you will have to do to calculate it. And then you will have to interpret what that means. So there's one more example. 
all we would do in this one is put in data into our list one, into our list two, find your regression equation, and now that your diagnostics are turned on, you will get an R value for this as well. And then depending on that R value, you are often asked to make a comment. So you need to say, since the R value is 0.9, this has a strong positive correlation. So you have to comment based on the R value about how strong the correlation is. So I'll leave this one for you. We'll have our group quiz on Monday. And we are done statistics.